it's interesting when when you have conversations down the years about why politicians should do interviews one of the questions that people would ask internally in places i was was working at was you know what's in it for them to do this interview and i always sort of thought well what's in it for them is that they get to run the country you know that's the bit that's in it that, that you know for them they they get to make decisions and, and pursue the, the ideas that they have they've been, they're, they're running the country and so, you know, they shouldn't regard this as a deal they do to kind of get good treatment. They should regard it as a duty they do. Part of the price they pay to run the country is to engage with the media. So, you know, that's breaking down. Um, and I think we're all, you know, the worry is that there's going to be a kind of conclusion where, you know, we can't do anything about it. But I think we need to sort of talk about it. We, there's been a, there's a push at the moment about transparency in journalism, about un people understanding exactly how things come about in journalism, how stories are, are built and how access is achieved. And I think we need to have an open conversation about this. And so then we could perhaps move the dial. But obviously, we also had Boris Johnson, who kind of broke these norms uh, on a kind of daily basis, really did set himself against against kind of the orthodoxy, you know, not going on the Today programme, all that stuff. And I think, you know, in a way, the Sunak government is supposedly offering a kind of a return to the norms as part of its offer, I suppose, but it's not got there all the way on this. And I think, you know, we've seen some kind of interesting stuff around that. They don't pick people up on the morning round. Sometimes they resort to robotic language of the type that did Theresa May in. So, you know, it's, it's that we need to have a conversation, but we must keep, we can't give up on this is my message. And I, I very much agree with you because I think up until that point, and and I come at this, obviously I've got two hats on now, I'm a, a, a presenter, but of course I was a, a, a political mm. advisor myself. And look, you know, we did our fair share of spin and robotic language, you will remember a terrible sort of um, like death loop of Ed Miliband talking about strikes going, everyone's got to get back the tip round the table like 47 times. I do so, remember that. Yeah. You know, uh, everyone's got to get back around the table. I mean, we, we've all, we've all sort of been there, but there was always a kind of, in my day, certainly a presumption that if I got a call from you or anybody else, I would take it to Ed as his press secretary and the team. And I'd be like, Rob Burley's been in touch in the Andrew Marshall. We, we've kind of got to, we've kind of got to do it. I mean, we might not want to sort of do it, but we've sort of got to do it. And everyone would sort of reluctantly roll their eyes and probably go, yeah, you're probably right. And then we would put a, a shift in trying to probably avoid a lot of the hard questions, but we would sort of do it. But mm. Boris Johnson ripped all those rules up, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think his attitude was once he'd won. I mean, remember you, you were talking about Ed there being the leader of the opposition. It's a different position to be in. I mean, it's, you know, in a way you need to, you know, I mean, I, I mean, that's just to go back to what you just said. I mean, in a way, that attitude that you talk about, that you had, like, you know, reluctantly do it, you know, avoid avoid pitfalls is understandable. It, but it's kind of part of the problem in a way, because it, it it should be an opportunity, really. It should have been an opportunity in those days for him to explain to the country why his vision was what it was and for the kind of him to really try and connect with people and be authentic. Unfortunately, people are so risk averse and scared of messing up that in a way they become different versions of themselves. And, you know, I'm sure that as, as, a, as a human being in reality, he was a very different person to the person you might've seen on a sofa or in the chair next to Andrew Marr, because he's so sort of hamstrung by those concerns. But Boris's attitude, anyway, he was in power, was that he won it. Him and Cummings and Kane, the, Lee Kane, who was his, his guy, their attitude was we've won and we reject the orthodoxies entirely. We chuck the norms out of the window in relation to what we're expected to do. And we go over the heads of the media. And all I'd say is it didn't work out very well for them. You know, I mean, actually, it's what I keep coming back to. It's not even any good for them. You know, Theresa May, she, didn't, she, she, she did things, but she did things in a way that was so ineffective communication wise. They were so robotic and uh, meaningless at times that she actually sowed the seeds of her own downfall. I mean, this is, this is an opportunity to talk to people. Yeah. You know, New Labour, they're, they're regarded as the kind of kings of the on message. but. If you remember back in the beginning of that period, when they were kind of coming to government and they were in opposition, there was a sort of excitement around them. And there was, I remember doing shows with uh, Mo Molum or, or Claire Shaw, and they'd be electrifying performances in front of studio audiences that would really get people going and get them galvanized and excited about the politics. And this seems to be lost. You know, we just have, no one's gonna get excited about these, these, uh, these, these kind of, this, the rhetoric that we hear. So you see, anyway, so, I mean, yeah, the norms were thrown, were thrown up, but I don't think it serves the politician well, it's part of no, my message. And I think it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't stress test the politician and it goes back to the sort of Margaret Thatcher point about wanting to be match fit. But also, I mean, there are some people who say, oh, like, what is the point of a long form interview? For me, particularly having worked on the other side, it, it is sort of the ultimate stress test, really. I mean, it is, it's very important accountability and it's quite a, a political test. I mean, if you're, if you're a man or woman, can't do 25 minutes with 
Andrew Neil, then mm. I think you're going to struggle to run the country. Yeah, look, that's absolutely right. And I think I think you know one of the one of the arguments that's made in the book by Brian Walden actually when he wrote so popular was that interview by the way it was actually turned into a book back in 1989 and he wrote a foreword in which he talked about the, the way in which a TV interview more than Parliament or anything like that is the best way to hold people accountable and to establish their suitability and, and, and kind of aptitude for the job. So let's, let's think about what we saw in recent times. We saw Boris Johnson avoiding scrutiny. We saw Liz Truss avoiding scrutiny. Both of them then fell fairly quickly in Liz Truss's case, obviously massively fast. She had not, you know, she, she, she likes the Thatcher cosplay. She likes to go on, 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 climb onto a, a tank, but she didn't want to do what Mrs. Thatcher did, which is not just about being tested, it's about saying, I want, I've got a story to tell. And Liz Truss had a, she had a big idea. Why didn't she go to the country more broadly than just the Tory uh, party and say, look, this is why I want to do this. Otherwise, we'll be stuck in a loop that's not going to get us anywhere. Um, and here's my big idea. And it's going to be hard, but come with me. Instead, she did the bare minimum and she crashed and burned. So it does, you know, it's an opportunity. It's a test. It's basically what we should be doing. And, yeah, it's, and also, it, you know, it, look, it, it, I think to to do that you have to have a lot of confidence and you also have to have a big idea and a big argument that you're willing to put forward and I think we feel like we're in a slightly different era of of politics right now it doesn't feel like we're in an era this is just in my view I suppose to sort of push back a bit just to give yeah. a sort of counter view that it's like grit in the oyster I suppose when I would have my sort of press advisor hat on even though you know I opportunities were very very important and we did feel we we must do these and do them do them well there were some times you just thought what is the point of going to do this interview when you're just mm. going to get absolutely mauled by a sort of grisly old lion like Jeremy Paxman I mean you in your book talk about a famous incident where um you said sometimes you know, you call Jeremy Paxman the sort of like, you know, grisly old line. And, and sometimes they'd be like an innocent gazelle that would get offered up for a mauling on Newsnight. That gazelle once was, for example, Chloe Smith, yes. uh, a, a young, um, you know, rising star who who kind of had a career ending yeah. interview with Jeremy Paxman. And to be fair to her, she was not like the kind of, you know, she wasn't like the big I am. She was sort of put up. Yeah. And, you can so when you have interviews like that, you can sort of see why sometimes politicians and their advisors go, "Nah, what what's the point?" Yeah, indeed. And I actually, I'm actually quite critical of that interview in the, in the book. In that I think it was it was kind of unfair. Uh, you know, it was. I mean, not that she you know she was a grown up, so she 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 was she was she was a minister in the treasury. So I guess she has you know she should have been able to deal with it better than she did. But it didn't feel like a very illuminating thing. It felt like a kind of uh, just a kind of a bit of theatre. And I think I think Jeremy even has talked about it as that. And look, and uh, you know. It's not to say that interviewers are perfect and that, and that you know, sometimes interviews you know, go wrong because of them. I'm saying, though, that it's, I mean, if you talk about Ed Miliband, for example, you're talking there about a leader of a party. He wants to be prime minister. So when you consider those opportunities, he needs to, he, in order to get to be prime minister, he needs to be able to articulate something that's going to make people wanting to be prime minister and cope with those situations and turn them into opportunities. I'm not underestimating how difficult that is. But it's pretty hard to be prime minister as well. So perhaps those two things, you know, what one one is actually harder than the other. This might be a, a gateway into the into the second thing, if you see what I mean. Yeah. So, you know, you've got. To, I just feel like it's just it's this defensiveness. It's this, and you know, I hear. I mean, I, here's the thing. I once uh, sat at a dinner with Rishi Sunak. Uh, I, I it, it, he must have been a nobody then because he was he was sitting next to me because I'm a nobody. <laughs> and um, and 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 actually he spoke normally he didn't he didn't construct his sentences in a way that was in, or were impenetrable or return to uh, stock phrases to to get through the conversation he just talked like a human being um, i rather liked him i got i warmed to him over the course of the evening um and yet i see him on television now repeating the same things over and over again returning to certain lines and i think i think you know i wonder why someone's not saying to him this isn't working for you why don't we try and be authentic why don't we try well, and People. I'll give you the answer to that. Having been in that that position, yeah. I think becoming a leading politician can turn the sort of coolest George Clooney type person. Not like I'm saying that these people are George Clooney like, but it's suddenly they just become complete dorks. They become sort of autonomous, and it's partly it's it's so much. Particularly people like Rishi Sunak, or even in my my old boss's case, Ed Miliband, people who hadn't really been that tested and suddenly mm. sort of got these big big jobs the scrutiny was a lot. And I think that does something to them psychologically. Yeah. And, you know, they've got a team of advisors going, don't eat like that. Don't look like that. Yeah. Don't breathe like that. Your hair is weird. You, you're having caricatures. So 
look, this is total fantasy, wishful thinking. I mean, is there a world where we in the media try and be a little bit more flexible without just ripping all politicians oh. to, to, to shreds so they can yeah. be a bit more human? Oh God, no, that, that absolutely goes alongside this. I mean, that's a good, but again, it's why I come back to, you don't do that in seven minutes. You know, you know if, you, if you say, look, I, you know, you say, look, we want to have a proper conversation with you about, about how you see these things we're going to talk about rather than just a seven minute sort of quick hurry drive by. Gotcha. That's, then there's the opportunity for that conversation to actually develop. I mean, actually, Rishi Sunak, funny enough, when he, he actually, unlike Liz Truss, was obviously partly because he was behind in the race, but he would do interviews during that leadership campaign. And actually, he did quite well. He could be quite effective. And you're right, he seems to have shrunk slightly. And now he's in the actual job. I'm just saying advisors of those people should be saying, look, look, you know, just try and loosen up a bit. Just try and be real. Don't just tell them to repeat the same lines. Why are they watching that stuff? for not telling him to stop mm. and, we, and it's not the first one Theresa may was allowed to do it for a whole premiership i mean she, and she'd do it for long interviews as well you know she'd <laughs> just stick to like crazy sort of formulations to try and get through entire interviews without saying anything so i mean that, know, i think we can expect more of these people 